Hi, and welcome to this concept bite, which is going to give you some of the details about the energy gap law, which helps to explain concepts like Cash's rule. So previously I've shown you this Euler-Blonsky diagram and we've met the quantum yield and the lifetimes equations, which say that the quantum yield for fluorescence depends upon uh, factors which include the rate of internal conversion, so vibrational relaxation um, for the molecule, and the rate of singlet to triplet inter-system crossing. But what helps govern how big these rates are? Well, that's given to us by the energy gap law. The energy gap law is a rather complicated equation, which I will never expect you to actually be able to use in anger, but I want you to be able to understand some of the important terms here. And I've highlighted a couple of the terms. One of them is the energy gap between the two, en two electronic energy levels, delta E, and the other one is the single vibration frequency, h bar omega. Now, this is essentially giving me the factors which are going to matter most to how well a molecule can lose energy by non-radiative processes. And it's saying that the bigger the energy gap between the electronic energy levels, the slower the rate of non-radiative decay, and the bigger the vibrational gaps, the slower the rate of vibrational decay. But I've also highlighted one other term here, which is the coupling matrix element. This is going to be incredibly important because it's essentially our overlap integral and we know how important that is to any process. The better the overlap integral between the wave functions of the two states, the better the process is likely to occur. So fundamentally, this means that I'm going to start to have isotope effects and these isotope effects matter whether I'm looking at the molecule or the solvent. Because if I've got to lose energy from my excited state chromophore, that energy has to go somewhere. So in a protiated sample, I have quite large steps between my vibrational energy levels. Um, and in a deuterated sample, those steps are much smaller. And so you might be tempted to think in deuterated samples, well, that would mean that I always see a, um, a more efficient non-radiative decay. But the other thing we've got to consider is the overlap integral, that matrix coupling element. And that's going to be a really important factor. So that's essentially my Frank Condon kind of overlap that I considered before when I was exciting a molecule. Practically, what does this effect of deuteration look like? Well, if I look in a, a protiated and a deuterated sample, I um, can see my rate of triplet to singlet intersystem crossing here and my lifetime of my triplet state. And we can see that when I deuterate my sample, my triplet state is actually considerably more longer lived. And it's because I have made that overlap integral much, much smaller. And I see this same thing happening in each of my molecules that I have listed here. So by deuterating my sample, I'm making my excited triplet state here more stable. There is another thing that I need to consider here when I'm thinking about non-radiative processes, and that is something called El Said's rule. Now, El Said's rule is specifically linked to um, inter-system crossing, and it is saying that if I can have a change in orbital type for the radiationless transition, the radiationless inter-system crossing, then the rate of that process is going to be greater. The increase in rate is about a factor of a thousand, so considerable um, change in the efficiency of the process if I can have a change in orbital type. Now, I've written each of these statements here, and I... I write them here because that's how they appear in textbooks, but I do think that actually looking at what's going on is considerably more helpful. So what it's saying here is that on the left-hand side here, I have an excited state singlet. This is my arrangement of electrons in my pi, my uh, non-bonding and my pi star orbitals. And it is saying that if I can have a, a movement around of my electrons such that I'm ex essentially exciting an electron from my um, bonding pi orbital into my non-bonding orbital, 
and it, my movement of electrons is there, um, then that process is going to be considerably quicker than me just flipping an electron. What does this mean in terms of a Yablonsky? Well, if I look at my Yablonsky, this is mean that I'm essentially having intersystem crossing not into the T1 ground state, but into an excited state here, a T2 excited state. And then we have radiationless transition because of Cash's rule uh, down to the lowest, um, the lowest level in that spin multiplicity set. These two factors together, Al Said's rule and the energy gap law, can give us a really good understanding and help us explain the rates of different processes. As I say, I would never expect you to be able to calculate any of these rates. I hope that this little video has been useful. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask.